I'm Ellis Martin. Join me for a conversation with Craig Chesky, the CFO of The Metals Company, trading on the NASDAQ as TMC. The Metals Company is an explorer of lower impact battery metals from seafloor polymetallic nodules on a dual mission. One, to supply metals for the clean energy transition with the least possible negative environmental and social impact. And two, to accelerate the transition to a circular metal economy. The Metals Company, through its subsidiaries, holds exploration and commercial rights to three polymetallic nodule contract areas in the clarion Clipperton zone of the Pacific Ocean. Regulated by the International Seabed Authority, sponsored by the governments of Nauru, Kiribati, and the Kingdom of Tonga. Go to the company's website, metals.co. Craig, welcome to the program. Great to visit with you today. Great to speak with you, Ellis. I've been at your website and I'm seeing something that really stands out. And I'm quoting here, the metals company is developing the world's largest estimated source of battery metals with enough nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese to electrify the entire U.S. passenger vehicle fleet. That is a bold statement, sir. It's a bold statement, but thankfully it's backed up by technical reports, both Canadian and SEC compliant. And it's in the form of polymetallic nodules. So look, five years ago, I had never heard of a polymetallic nodule, but this is a resource that is huge. It's secure. It's relatively close to the United States, and it does have the potential to completely change the supply demand outlook for metals like nickel and cobalt and manganese. In fact, if you're talking about EVs, the U.S. effectively has zero primary production today of nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And what we have in this resource is sufficient to take us to self-sufficiency in all three of those. So it's a, it's a different type of resource. It just lays unattached on on top of the seafloor. But if you're talking about scale, nothing can move the needle for U.S. supply chains like this resource. Now we're going to get into undersea mining in this conversation. And I've seen a few ideas floated over the last 10 or 20 years or so. And I always thought, well, how do you do that? How is it economic? And it's some sort of pipe dream. Might as well be space mining. Yeah, look, we actually have somebody on our team, our head of strategy, who was in space mining, in asteroid mining. And she'll tell you this is actually a reality. And it's something that can move the needle very soon. In fact, we anticipate being in production less than two years from now. In the context of metals and mining, that's just around the corner. But yeah, it's something that sounds science fiction right away, but it's something that was known about for a very long time. In fact, if you go back to the 1870s, it was the British, the HMS Challenger, that discovered nodules in this part of the Pacific Ocean between Mexico and Hawaii. And they have very high concentrations of nickel and manganese and copper and cobalt. A lot of the base metals near the Rocky Mountains and the Andes, metals ended up dissolved around this fracture zone. It is very, very deep and very, very dark and they form over millions of years. So this is a resource that's been known about for a very long time. And in fact, you can go back to the 1960s and 70s. You had a lot of companies like BP, Shell, Sumitomo, Mitsubishi, Lockheed Martin that were successfully collecting thousands of tons of these nodules. So the technology to do it is something well in hand. And in fact, we showed in the fourth quarter of last year that we can collect nodules off the sea floor and get them on the surface. We did 3000 tons over the course of a couple of days. So it's not a technology issue. The reason that you may not have heard of it before is that it's a regulatory issue. There was an agreement back in the 1970s on who owned the oceans within international waters. So this is really a long time coming. It's many decades in the making, but certainly the technology to do it and the cost to do it are pretty well understood and well at hand. You and I met a few weeks ago in Las Vegas at the one to one mining conference, and I had a chance to look at these modules in person. I'm also now on your website, and it looks to me that the ocean floor some Somehow, Mother Nature, if you will, the earth has already done a lot of the processing for you. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, these nodules have such high grade of the metals. In fact, if you're talking about nickel, you roll all of the nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese within this resource. Just think of them in nickel equivalents so you can compare it to other nickel projects. It is a resource that is 3.2% nickel. That may not sound like a lot, but then you compare it to most other types of nickel resources on land. The large undeveloped nickel resources in Canada or the U.S., for example, are 0.2% to 0.3%. So we are more than 10 times higher grade than the equivalent projects on land. So that's very important in that the economics to collect these and really the environmental impacts of collecting them are driven by how much metal you're getting for how many molecules you're moving. And we just have to move a lot fewer molecules to get the same amount of metal. And in terms of the processing side, yes, this is a very unique resource and it's very big. But once you get them to shore and you process them, they actually behave very similarly to nickel laterite. Nickel laterite is the form of nickel that we're familiar with, let's say, underneath the rainforests of Indonesia, which is where most nickel is expected to come from in the coming decades 
States, and which, by the way, is mainly controlled by China with guaranteed offtake to China. But these nodules that we can pick up off the sea floor at much lower cost, much lower environmental impact, and actually be processed using flow sheets and technology at processing facilities that already exist. Is it more economic than every other traditional way of mining nickel? Not every other traditional way. We anticipate being the second lowest cost producer of nickel. So if you look at a C1 cost curve, measuring your cash costs relative to other nickel producers, we anticipate being the second lowest cost producer in the world behind Russia. The Norilsk operation in Siberia is even lower cost because they have a lot of byproducts such as gold and platinum and palladium. So those are worth a lot. But the byproducts that we have, copper, cobalt, and manganese, those are worth quite a bit as well. So we would anticipate producing nickel at negative $2.40 a pound once we're at full-scale production, that's with roughly five drill ships running at the same time. We already have the first drill ship that would be our first operations or at the end of 2024, early 2025. But make no mistake, in pretty much any scenario here, we're in the lowest quartile of the nickel cost curve. You mentioned these ships. I've seen photographs of one of the ships. We're not talking about a pilot project, a technology that has to be perfected. It is done and ready to go quite soon. That's absolutely right. What we showed in the fourth quarter of last year, alongside our partner All Seas, which is a Dutch offshore oil and gas company, they do a lot of cable and pipe laying in the deep ocean. They do this project and said, look, we've been working in the deep ocean for a very long time at high pressure, very low depths. And this is something that they thought they were well suited to do and they proved it. And in the fourth quarter of last year, we collected 3000 tons of these nodules off the seafloor. The system is effectively a collector robot on the seafloor. Think of a really big Roomba going over the bottom of the seafloor, just picking up these nodules. And again, they sit unattached. There is no digging. There's no blasting. There's no drilling. So once you collect them, then they go up on air bubbles on a 4,000 meter riser pipe to a drill ship waiting on the surface, the type of drill ship that would be used to seeing in the offshore oil and gas space. So really the technology to do it, all the pieces are there. And what we showed in the fourth quarter of last year is the first integrated test of such a system since the 1970s. So we're not reinventing the wheel here, but it was very important to show that, yeah, we can do this and we could do it economically. We peaked at 86 tons per hour production rate, and we have some modifications that we're gonna make over the next 18 to 24 months to get that up to 200 tons per hour. And these are not big engineering challenges. It's effectively, you have a wider diameter riser pipe, you have bigger collector heads, you have more collector heads, but it's all the type of technology that we and our partner all sees consider to be well in hand. Usually investors that follow mining companies like to see a defined resource. Is that nearly impossible to do in this scenario? It's actually the contrary. That's what I look for in investing in a mining company as well. My prior career, I worked at a hedge fund based in New York covering diversified metals and mining companies. And looking at a credible source of a technical report from the right type of third party to know how big the resource is and of what quality and of what grade, that's a prerequisite for investing. Well, we have that. We're the only contract within the Clearing Clipperton Zone that has a defined resource statement. We have it that's both Canadian 43101 standard and SEC SK1300 standard. And both of those say effectively the same thing. This is a very, very large resource with very high grade. The reason there is such confidence, well, if you think about defining that resource on land, well, you drill a bunch of holes at regular intervals and you're trying to assess what is the shape of an underground, unseeable 3D world body. What we have here is very different. It's a two-dimensional resource. It sits on top of the seafloor. And it's in an area that is so deep and so dark, there is no plant life. So there's nothing to obscure the vision of what's lying there on top of the seafloor. So we do take samples similar to what you would think about for drill holes on land. We take, take box core samples, roughly one square meter. It's a turf cutter that goes down to the bottom of the seafloor and it takes a little sample of the seafloor and it brings it back up. And we have many hundreds of those. And you can weigh how many nodules are in each square meter. You can check for grade. And the nice thing about these nodules is the grade is very consistent from one rock to the next. It's because of the way these nodules are formed. They precipitate the metals, very similar to the way of pearl forms. So the grade of each nodule is effectively the same. And the only other question is, well, how many nodules do you have in a particular area? So I mentioned that you can sample it, but the real trump card here is that you can actually survey it. You can take images of it. And we have over 180,000 square kilometers of bathymetric survey data. And it's effectively like looking at a big QR code. You can see dark areas where the nodules are, white areas where the nodules are not. So it's very easy to tell over a wide area where to go to get these nodules. And we can put all of that into our technical reports, which we have. And I would encourage anybody to go to investors.metals.co and you can read those technical reports for yourself. Do those images also give you an idea of the grade as well? They don't give you an idea of the grade, which is very important to then assay the nodules many hundreds of miles apart. And what you'll see for our technical reports and from the box core samples that we've taken 
a nodule that might be in location A would have effectively the same grade as a nodule that might be 100 miles away in location B. So that would be roughly 1.3% nickel, 1.1% copper, 0.2% cobalt, and nearly 30% manganese. So it is a very, very consistent resource over a very wide area. And we're not the only ones out there. There are a lot of other contractors too, who have been studying this area for a very, very long time. And other contractors might be China, which has two contracts, Russia, Japan, Singapore, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Belgium. So there is a pretty agreeable consensus that these nodules are consistent and agreed and everybody recognizes where they are and where they are not. You spoke about China and Russia earlier. With regard to Russia, you mentioned that country as the leading source of nickel right now. However, again, according to your website and Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, life cycle assessment by Benchmark shows your company's Norite D nodule project could outperform land-based routes of producing nickel, copper, and cobalt in almost every impact category analyzed. No, that's a very strong statement, but it was a statement that we've been making for several years. You can go back to white papers in 2020 that do suggest getting the same amount of nickel from nodule on the seafloor can reduce carbon impacts by over 90% versus traditional conventional paths on land. But it's one thing for us to say it, and it's easier for some potentially to dismiss it, to say, well, of course, the middle company is going to say it are the best. So we said, okay, let's put our money where our mouth is. We hired Benchmark, which is a blue chip, top-notch research firm with chip within metals research. And we said, here's all the data. What do you guys see? And they came out and then this LCA, life cycle analysis, also went to a third-party review and all of it confirmed we knew that for nickel across every impact category measured, whether it's CO2 impacts, waste, acid, water use, across the board. And we didn't even measure tailings because we produce zero tailings. So that's another benefit of this resource. Nickel from Nori D came out on top. It was very similar for copper, but cobalt, we were number one, except for two categories, we were number two. So it was helpful to have something to work on, but pretty much without exception, this life cycle analysis showed that this is a better way to get the metals needed for the clean transition. And you didn't mention Russia. Russia is the number one producer for a class one nickel, the type that typically goes into battery grade. What we're now seeing in the industry is that Chinese funded production is trying to take a lower class two grade nickel and convert that into class one to what is a very carbon intensive process, sometimes converting nickel pig iron into battery grade material. So all of that carbon necessary to take what is a pretty difficult product, nickel laterites, sitting underneath the rainforest of Indonesia, that can't be the only way. There has to be an alternative to that source for the clean energy transition. And we think nodules represent that. Does the metals company have perhaps the best way environmentally of producing nickel compared to all these other land-based routes, which can be problematic with regard to the indigenous population of these various areas around the world, the rainforest, as you mentioned, there's a slew of permitting issues that provide a lot of great nickel projects from ever happening, from ever becoming mines. That's right. That's right. And we do think by far that this is the best choice for getting nickel. Now, if you Google the metals company, if you Google deep sea mining, you will see plenty of negative art. This is not an industry without opposition. In fact, what the opposition tends to do is they try to lump all deep sea mining together to say, we should never do it. We should never do it. There are various types of deep sea mining. There are seafloor massive salt bites. There are cobalt crust. These are the types of deep sea mining where you actually are separating the ore from the substrate. You're using explosive bump, explosives underwater, and you're usually operating in areas with more bioactivity. What we're talking about here is different. It's a different type of deep sea mining. It's the collection of polymetallic nodules that are unattached to the seafloor. Just like on land, there are some projects that are defensible and some projects that probably shouldn't go forward. And that same type of nuance needs to be applied to the deep sea. And we think what we're going after in terms of these nodules are a very special case. Now, there are issues that we need to mitigate and manage, and we've hired many, many research institutions and many top grade scientists to help us manage and mitigate impacts. For example, when we collect nodules, it'll kick up a little bit of C4 dust, a little bit of mud and sediment. What MIT in the Scripps Ocean Institute in California has come up with is a model that suggests, you know what? The plume, the dust kicked up by nodule collection, generally rises one to two meters above the seafloor and then settles very quickly within the test area. So we think the impacts here are just a different scale of impact. And they are things that we need to consider and manage, but compare that to what's necessary for nickel laterites in Indonesia, which is where most of the growth is coming from. You have to cut down a rainforest and then you have to go after a very low grade product. And by the way, in digging up that material, you're releasing sequestered carbon into the atmosphere. You have issues with indigenous communities. You have issues with hexavalent chromium. You have deep sea tailings disposal or 
tailings, that requires more hectares of forest to be destroyed as well through dry stack tailings. There are a host of other issues that we don't have time to get into now, but our view is this is very lightly the lowest potential impact way to get nickel for the clean energy transition. Have you begun relationships with end users? As we head into 2024 and eventual production, I would think that that's part of your calculus right now and perhaps a funding source. That's exactly right. We've been having conversations with potential buyers of our metal. We see it as a potential upside. We see it as a nice to have. We don't think this is a scenario where we must sign an offtake immediately. It would be nice to be able to say, here is a major North American automaker, for example, coming up and saying nodules are the solution, they're lower carbon, we're all going to have to start reporting our carbon content in our EVs very soon. That is coming. It's already coming in Europe, it'll be coming in North America soon too. And this is a much, much better relative source to these metals. So we think eventually that'll take care of itself. But right now we already have an offtake with Glencore. Glencore is a shareholder in TMC. They have an offtake for half of the nickel and half of the copper from our Ndori area. So that is nice to have a partner that's very credible in there, but there's going to be a lot of material available for other potential buyers. If there's some scenario where we're in production and certain customers have said, well, the press on deep sea mining still is a little hot, so perhaps I'll get my nickel elsewhere. We'll be able to sell on the open market. We'll be able to sell to locations in Asia. In fact, we've been talking to a lot of companies within Japan, within India, who need a lot of this material, not just the nickel and the copper and the cobalt, but 30% of our future revenue would be manganese, which goes into blast furnace steel making. And Sintef, which is a Norwegian research firm, came up with an analysis that suggests our manganese is 7 to 17% higher value in use than typical manganese products products with a much lower carbon bill. So no matter which metal you're looking at, we're going to find interested buyers. We would love nothing more than to wake up tomorrow and have an offtake beyond the one that we already have with Glencore, but we want to make sure it's the right one. Well, considering you have Glencore involved, you can afford to take your time concerning more offtake partners in the future. I certainly respect that. Let's talk about the share structure of your company. How does it break down? Right now we have a little less than 280 million shares on standing. By the way, we have no debt. We do have a unsecured credit facility, which remains undrawn. So out of those called 280 million shares, approximately 60% are what we would consider safe hands. The likes of our CEO and chairman, Gerard Barron, Andre Karkar, who is sitting on the board of TMC. He's the largest single shareholder, at approximately 20%. And then Alsees, who is the Dutch offshore company that I mentioned, they've already invested $130 million into TMC directly. They made available an unsecured credit facility that we reported just a few weeks ago. And they've also, on their own balance sheet, spent quite a bit more than that just on the development of the, the collection system and the drill ship that they purchased on our behalf in early 2020. So Alsees is in it in a very big way. So between Alsees, our board members, our CEO, and other holders that have been with us for a long time since we were a private company, roughly 60% of those shares are held by what I would consider safe hands. So a question that we often get is, look, you are a SPAC that had a rocky run of it, as a lot of SPACs have. So what's preventing you from being private? And that answer is, look, our company with a very devoted shareholder base and people who recognize this isn't going to be a question up, is it 80 cents, is it $2, is it $3? This is an opportunity and this is a resource size that is so massive that everybody wants to make sure we maintain control, keep the market, excuse me, keep the project on track and make sure that we get into production and that it will be valued at what we think is a fair percentage of the underlying asset value in our contract areas. Right now, Ellis, we're trading at roughly 1% of the net present value of just our first block alone, what we call Nori D. You can go on our website and see the model for Nori D. AMC Consultants in 2021 said Nori D was worth about $7 billion today. If you ran that same math, at crude metal prices, it would be worth in excess of $13 billion. And we're only trading at around 1% of that, just on our first block low. A typical resource company two, mu- or, excuse me, two years away from production might expect to trade at 20% or 30% of NPV. So there is a major disconnect between the size of the resource that we're developing and what the market is currently valuing with that. What kind of options exist for you as a company in the future and the investors that are either part of your company right now or considering investing at some point? Specifically, what I'm referring to is, will you be a miner, remain a miner, or can we see a possible M&A in the future? Yeah, we would expect to stick to our knitting here for a little while, recognizing that we do control what mining.com recognized as the number one and number two largest nickel projects in the world. And as we get the first project up and running, we'll have an opportunity to take what is going to be a major amount of positive free cash flow and reinvest it into developing some of the other blocks 
within our two contract areas, both of which again already have Canadian and SDC compliant resource statements. So I think you should expect us to continue to reinvest in the business as we ramp up. Over time, and I'm talking 2040s, 2050s and beyond, what we intend to do here is inject a sufficient amount of metal into the system such that we can decarbonize and then start recycling the metals from EV batteries. Right now, you can't recycle what you don't have. There's this insufficient amount of supply. You could recycle all the EV batteries in the world, and it's not going to make a dent at how much is going to be needed over the next 20 years. Once you make that big injection of metals into the system, however, we see a role for us in actually recycling those batteries to get Again, the nickel and the cobalt and the other elements necessary for a continued transition. So we can see that down the road. But right now, we're very much focused on let's get into production. Let's show that we can do it. Let's show that we're free cash flow positive, which we would anticipate being very, very quickly after getting into production, a matter of months. And that's one of the great things about this resource is that I talked about recycling the batteries. Effectively, what we're doing to get in production is recycling existing operating assets. And that means we already have our first system, which will be production ready when we start mining towards the end of 2024, early 2025. So unlike on my end where you might get your permit and then say, okay, now I have to go build everything. We don't have that situation. It's just a question of let's get the boat on the water and let's start running. Well, this is certainly the most exciting mining company I have seen in my years in the business. And that's about 25 years specifically covering mining companies, anything involved with mining. And I wish you all the best. I drive an EV, a Tesla Model S. There's nothing economic about that car at all, except for I know I'm not polluting in the cities that I drive in. And I'm hoping that due to companies such as yours, you'll help drive down the cost of EVs for everyone. That is our goal. That's our ambition. And as we get closer to production, that is going to happen. So as our CEO said in an interview just this week with mining.com, this is no longer a question of if it's going to happen. It's a question of when. And people should expect to see more and more headlines over the coming years. And it's a great time to be doing work on our company in this industry. So Ellis, I appreciate you taking the time. Craig Chesky, CFO of The Metals Company. Thank you so much for joining me today on the program. Thank you, Ellis. It's been a pleasure. I've been speaking with Craig Chesky, the CFO of The Metals Company, trading on the NASDAQ as TMC. Go to the company's website, metals.co. I'm Ellis Martin. Would you like to be one of the first to see who we are following? Subscribe to our audio newsletter. It's free. EllisMartinReport.com.